Welcome to a mini episode of Alpine Intel's Savvy Adjuster Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Nichols, and this is a quick follow-up to our last episode, which was wind damage to asphalt shingles. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode, you can find it on your favorite podcast platform. Today, I am back with our guests from that episode, Forensic Engineer Gary Ellis and Alpine Intel's Technical Education Trainer, Kevin Hulesman, to talk about what evidence of wind damage we might see on a property besides the roof. Uh, thanks for joining us again, Kevin and Gary. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Good to be here. Well, first, can we uh, can we talk about why it's important to look at indicators during a roof claim that maybe aren't on the roof itself? Kevin, I'll I'll, uh, I'll throw this one to you here. Um, appreciate it, Chris. So, as that prior adjuster. Um, the roof only told part of the story and if i wanted to you know pay for a repair or pay to replace a roof you know i needed to have surrounding data that said the damage on the roof is a wind related is is a weather event so really the you know what we'll call collateral investigation was a huge part of it um especially on the larger claims you know if you need uh, as an adjuster you may need approvals to to pay over certain amounts or whatnot and that's the first thing that the managers are going to look at is like you know yes there's some something going on in the roof we can both agree that something's going on but like what else is going on on the site that says the stuff on the roof is or is not wind damage so the collateral investigation was one of the biggest pieces it says everything i'm seeing on the roof is consistent or inconsistent with what i'm seeing on the rest of the property so it's one of the key points sure yeah well and, and we kind of teased it at the, at the beginning and, and in the main episode but, but you know the main thing we're like to discuss on today's mini episode are basically five key indicators of wind damage we may see that again aren't on the roof and uh gary uh did you want to start us off with uh, some of those indicators sure yeah and, and i'll um just back up a little bit again on the need for looking at those indicators is the roof product whatever the roof covering is is kind of a design product it should withstand if it's doing what it should do it should withstand higher wind speeds but there's a lot of a lot of things on site that are not designed or structural um, certain claddings trees shrubbery landscaping i mean there's things on site that that should fail before the roof cover does now that doesn't you know this not necessarily the rule um you know the roof is typically the highest thing on the property so it you know may see higher wind speeds but again you always got to take a good look for collateral indicators and you start on the, you know, when I, when I pull up to the site, first thing I do is ask the owner. And the first thing they tell me, yeah, the roof was damaged by wind or the contractors tell me the roof was damaged by wind. Well, what else on site uh, was damaged during this storm? Sometimes they say, well, nothing else, you know, so that's where I'm starting. Uh, they, they say nothing else was damaged or they tell me we had to replace whatever. Um, so either way, I'm looking on site. Is are there any trees down? That kind of thing. Um, just to start closest to the roof, let's say uh, the fascia, uh, soffit claddings, gutters. Um, you know those things. Um, again, it's it's there's there's no uh, design criteria that says a fascia should hold up at uh, a certain speed. And if they're not nailed properly or, or maybe the substrate isn't in great condition, those just get pulled away by wind. Uh, the gutters fall off with wind, that kind of thing. That's a, that's a starting point. Yeah, to Gary's point, I mean, why, why, you know, beat yourself up? Like, look for the easiest stuff first. And, you know, so, you know, Gary mentioned the, the soffits and then, the, like, the flashing items. You know, those things are just like basically tacked onto the house, especially like uh, aluminum wraps around like corner posts or around windows. Those are typically just secured in place with, you know, smaller nails. Maybe they're relying on, you know, silicones and caulkings to hold them on. Um, to, you know, Gary said there's, there's no wind rating on, on those items. There, there is on asphalt shingles. So that's the easy stuff. Look for the easiest stuff first. Um, you know, the, that kind of leads into the, one of the next vulnerable things that, that I would look for is the siding. 
um, you know, vinyl siding's particularly vulnerable, um, especially when it's installed over something. You know, unless that home's newer and the first layer of siding is vinyl, um, a lot of times it's not secured properly. Um, or the wind and weather and Mother Nature has already done her thing and, and those sealants are already worn out. Um, if they catch an edge on vinyl siding, it might peel, you know, like a whole side of the house off. Um, you know, that kind of goes back into the, you know, walking around the whole house, investigating the whole thing. Um, you know, one of those sides of the house should probably be worse off than the other ones because storms are directional. And, and vinyl siding is an easy way to tell that. Be like, hey, we got missing siding on the left side of the house. Um, but the siding on the right side opposite or the, the leeward side of the storm is is doing OK. Um, so the siding would be the next thing I'd probably take a look at after you know, Gary's suggestion. And so, Gary, what, what would you say would be the next thing that we should be looking at outside of obviously the, the roof? Well, so um, on property, you've got. Um, things around on the deck, around the yard. Um, let's just go out to the you know, trees, tree limbs blown down. Are there any trees down? In the tree? um, and this is the kind of stuff you see as you're driving in to a neighborhood. Um, are there piles of tree limbs out in front of everybody's house because everybody had to clean up their yards after the storm? Um, that's a good indicator that, yeah, there was some kind of event here. Um, fences blown down. You know. Uh, Privacy fences are more solid, so um, they may catch wind. And you would expect, uh, kind of like what Kevin mentioned, you would expect some directionality here. So a wind from the wet west, I mean, you, might, you might expect uh, um, fences running north south on a property would be blown over towards the east. Um, that's a good indicator that, that you had a wind from the west. Right. And, and Kevin, so um, what are we at? That was, uh, what are we on? Number three or number four? Um, that was three. So I think that was three. Gotcha. Um, so number four, Kevin, what do, what do you got for us as far as uh, things to be looking for uh, while on site? So my favorite one was always uh, surrounding property damage. Um, uh, as an adjuster, I knew my job was going to be either significantly easier or significantly harder as as I was driving into the neighborhood, I saw a street uh, full of roofing signs, roofing contractor signs. Um, you know, if there's a, a, my roof got replaced on an insurance claim sign in the middle of the, um, you know, the road leading up to the property I was about to inspect, you know, somebody's been there and either they are the best salespeople in the world and got a whole bunch of, you know, questionable insurance claims or, you know, like all these roofs are really, really beat up. And now it's just my job to document it and pay for it and move on. So, yeah, the surrounding roofs um, were always a key indicator. Um, the opposite is true of what I just said. If I rolled into a neighborhood and I didn't see tarps on roofs and I didn't see debris in the street and I didn't see a whole lot of, uh, you know, contractor signs in the front yard, I'd have been like, you know, what's what's going on here? You know, is this is this really a wind claim or, or whatnot? So, yeah, the other roofs in the neighborhoods um, were a good spot. And that, that might be the reason you're there. You know, maybe another neighbor in the same neighborhood, you know, was talking to, to Phyllis around the corner and Phyllis said, you know, hey, I just got my roof replaced for a wind claim with insurance. You should check your roof too. And, you know, so you might be there for that reason as well. But the if the all the houses around you uh, had severe damage and your roof is similar in age and condition you know there's a, there's a good chance that you're going to find um the same or similar damage profiles on that particular property or or a pushy contractor in the area or a pushy contractor many, or a pushy um, contractor this is one of the many reasons that um you know i don't envy the the adjuster's position is if all the neighbors are getting new roofs and this person's roof is getting their claim is getting denied it's hard to swallow because all the neighbors are getting new roofs yep and then you run to the comment be like if if my roof's not you know if i don't get a new roof i'm going to switch insurance companies you're like Ugh. and the reason like, i mentioned is, is is again we're talking about indicators so it's not evidence that there's roof damage just because all the neighbors are getting new roofs. It's not evidence that we have damage at the moment. 
Yeah, and I think that's a, another important point too is you have all the information in front of you and it's it's free to share. It's a difficult conversation to have as an adjuster, but if you're honest with them, you know, most people, well-adjusted people will be like, okay, yeah, you know, my fence is not down and no, my trees aren't down and no, I'm not missing siding and I don't have any torn up screens. And yes, my roof is 25 years old and it's the original one to the house. And so, yeah, I, I understand why your position is what it is. I don't agree with it, but I understand where you're coming from. So, um, yeah, don't be afraid to have that that conversation, especially if you've taken the time to do a thorough investigation and provide all that background information to them. Sure. Well, I think I think we are at number five of the indicators, and uh, I'll, Gary, I'll let you uh, I'll let you take us home on this one. Well, so. The weather research is a critical part of it. Um, sometimes you're lucky and you'll find some weather station or some event data nearby, which sometimes is a home run. Maybe the house is a mile from the airport. So there's, there's a weather station right there at the airport saying that there was an 80 mile per hour wind or something like that. Um, sometimes you're not so lucky and the nearest weather station is 50 miles away. Wind can vary significantly over short distances. So um, that's where these other indicators and the physical damage is become becomes the most important thing. But again, just just finding the data to prove there was something in the area. There was a storm. Um, you know, the local airport, the local weather stations support that. Then then NOAA, um, the um, National Oceanic Atmospheric Association, they record storm events in the storm reports. So um, with significant hailstorms, windstorms, um, they record that data. You may find that uh, you know in the neighborhood or within so many miles away that people reported trees down, wires down, roofs off. Uh, you'll find those reports uh, through NOAA. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, before this discussion started, I just assumed I was as an adjuster showing up to go and look at a roof. Uh, but it sounds like there are a lot of other things that when even driving to the claim site that you need to have kind of your eyes open for that'll lend to that, uh, that, that, uh, investigation, if you will. So, um, yeah. and yeah, Kevin, it's, it's, I, I, I was actually promised, um, and put you on the spot, a fun fact that you have to kind of wrap up the episode, uh, on, well, I'll let you I'll let you share your fun fact, which I find pretty interesting. Well, so it does tie into the historical weather data, you know, the NOAA data and the National Weather Service data. Um, you know, when we're talking about wind speeds. Um, we just recently did a uh, education piece here at Alpine and Donan for um, hurricane damage. And I got to learn the distinct difference between the CAT scale um, a category scale for hurricanes. Um, it's actually called the Saffir Simpson scale and the um, EF scale, the, the tornado scale or the enhanced Fujita scale. So, um, you know, when we're talking about weather data, nothing better than categories or EF scales um, to, to put in your claim file to back up what you are or are not seeing. Um, but the Saffir Simpson scale, um, is actually a measured wind speed. It's a recorded measured wind speed. And I just assume that the EF scale was the same thing. Um, so the EF scale is an estimated wind speed. Um, so the Saffir Simpson scale uses like a 10 meter pole and a, a planted weather station that's put out there prior to the event since you can kind of forecast and see where that hurricane's coming from. And so you get real data that says this storm produced this much uh, continuous wind. I think it's two or three minutes of sustained wind is how they measure that, that wind speed for that category system. Um, whereas with a tornado, you don't really know where those are going to drop. And so you don't, also don't have time to go roll a weather station out to an area that might get hit by a tornado, which is much smaller footprint, obviously, than than a hurricane. And that EF scale, that EF one through five, is based on damage profiles. So after a tornado, you're out there looking at the damage and the, the wreckage of this storm. And engineers like Gary, um, you know, put together uh, a scale that says, hey, this stick built 
two by six construction framed home with asphalt shingles, you know, if we're missing some shingles and some tree limbs, you know, we're probably not even on the EF scale. Um, but if we're missing the house and it looks like a bulldozer went through, maybe we're, you know, significantly higher in like the high 100s or low 200 mile an hour wind speed. So I thought that was interesting, um, you know, learning that to to um, help present for Alpine here. But uh, yeah, there's, there's your little fun fact, Chris. I, I, I was promised a fun fact and a fun fact was delivered. So I appreciate that, Kevin and, and Gary. Thank you so much for joining us for the mini episode. And obviously for everybody listening um, during our next Savvy Adjuster podcast, my co-host Whitney Bowles is going to discover or discuss the uh, basics of HVAC equipment and claims with our guest, Kurt Van Ness, who is the technical director for HVACI. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about wind damage or getting an expert assessment on a reported wind damage claim, check the show notes. There is additional details for Alpine Intel resources in there. We'll see you next time. 